So, okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome again to the deep stereo matching tutorial. And uh, so let's start uh, with a very brief uh, introduction about uh, the speakers. So Fabio and me are the two speakers in this tutorial. We are both assistant professors at the University of Bologna, and we were working on stereo matching for, I would say something like 10 and seven years respectively, under the guidance of Professor Stefano Mattoccia. And during this time, we witnessed basically everything starting from uh, when stereo matching was carried out with uh, simple handcrafted algorithms until the introduction of deep learning, uh, the very first steps uh, using deep learning, and until now when we are basically using uh, uh, deep, stereo network in deep stereo networks in place of everything that we were running before. So, uh, I would like to start with this uh, this picture taken from the 3DV X account, uh, which is basically sketching the type of 3D vision papers you can uh, figure out, you can find uh, at a conference. And uh, I guess if you guys are here today, probably you belong to this category of researchers that are still working on stereo. And uh, why do we say still working on stereo? because maybe many people working on 3D vision feel stereo matching is already solved. And today in this tutorial, we will try to um, give some answers to these uh, questions. That is, uh, why should we still work on stereo? Well, we will see that uh, in the very last uh, two to three years, uh, uh, even starting from very good results from the previous decade, we were able to further improve the accuracy of uh, what we can get out of stereo images. So this is a quick uh, overview of uh, how the tutorial will look like. We start with a 10 minutes introduction about uh, what we have seen until 2020. And so from where we will start uh, on today's lecture. And then we will have three main uh, topics. One about uh, the most recent architectures that appeared in the last three years. One about the domain shift issue that is a well-known problem in this field and in general, at any time you use uh, a neural network to solve some kind of problem. And finally, to some uh, challenges that were considered open until a few years ago, and that are some of them still considered open today. Finally, in about uh, three hours, uh, we will draw some conclusions and we will try to sketch some possible future, future direction for the years to come. So before we start, uh, this is not the first tutorial we run about stereo matching. We already ran two, one in CVPR 19 and one in ECCV 20. The former focused on the very first steps that were moved to bring stereo matching in the deep learning era. The second one was aimed at uh, um, addressing some of the issues that uh, were brought in by these this paradigm shift toward deep learning. In particular, in ECCV, we started talking about domain shifts and how to deal with them. The content of both tutorial has been covered by a TPAMI paper that we published in 2020. Here you can find a reference, but uh, of course, uh, on the website of our tutorial, we, will, we have already shared all the materials and you can find a detailed reference there. So, Let's uh, recap very quickly what uh, stereo matching is. Uh, you probably already know. Stereo matching is the task uh, uh, aimed at estimating depth out of two rectified images. In particular, if the images are rectified like this, uh, we can find the disparity between the pixels on the left image by simply looking at uh, where they appear on the right image and then computing the difference in terms of X coordinate of each pixel. This difference is the so-called disparity that can be plotted, as we can see here, in uh, the so-called disparity map. In particular, this one was obtained by a very popular uh, handcrafted algorithm, which is semi-global matching. And given the disparity map, we can obtain depth by simply knowing the focal length and the baseline distance between the two cameras that collected the two pictures. And uh, for decades, this uh, task was uh, uh, faced by implementing an crafted algorithm, and each algorithm was uh, characterized by a sub, a sub uh, sequence of different steps from the so called stereo pipeline. The stereo pipeline assumes four different uh, phases one for computing the initial cost between uh, 
each pixel on the left image and some candidates on the right image. The second stage assumes to aggregate this cost according to local patterns. The third stage assumes to optimize the information we can get from cost and obtain a first disparity map. And finally, we have an optional fourth step for refining the disparity map that we get in advance. So in 2015, the very first approach to machine learning by stereo matching was to start replacing these single stages with some learnable components. So at first we had some neural networks capable of computing the matching cost. Then we had some frameworks for aggregating the cost and optimizing the cost volume, depending on some additional information, such as confidence measures, for instance. And we also add, of course, some neural networks capable of refining a disparity map we could get from an off-the-shelf stereo algorithm to make it a little more accurate. So this was the, at the very first. Then in 2016, 2017, we replaced the, everything with end-to-end -end architectures. That means we started designing complex uh, neural networks that took in a, as input uh, true rectified images and produces as output uh, a dense disparity map. Of course, any of these architectures in their design are, are inspired to some extent to the general pipeline, but uh, we are no longer dividing uh, the algorithm in steps. We have a single model that estimates everything in end-to-end -end manner. And the success of these uh, kind of solutions was also possible thanks to the increasing availability of uh, training data. In particular, the more, more data sets we could get for training these models, and for training data set, I mean a collection of stereo pairs uh, together with uh, some depth labels associated to the pixels themselves. The more the data we could get, the more accurate the results we can obtain. Indeed, in this example, I'm showing a picture from the Kitty data set that is a very popular data set uh, concerning autonomous driving. And these are the results obtained with an end-to-end -end architecture trained on the entire dataset made available by Kitty itself. So the increasing availability of such dataset made continuously improving the accuracy of the, these neural networks independently on the network design itself. However, the availability of training data we have today is not the same we got at the very beginning. In particular, at the very beginning to provide enough training data uh, to a stereo model. The use of synthetic images was very, very popular. And at the very beginning, if we only trained a stereo network on a synthetic data set, then when we moved to real images like this, uh, the network struggled at providing meaningful solutions, meaningful disparity maps. This was because uh, the initial stereo models and uh, the training routine that were used to optimize them were not capable of filling the gap between the fake synthetic images and the real images we could get. And of course, these real images uh, have, are affected by several factors such, such as uh, the camera noise, uh, some illumination changes, a lot of uh, real effects that are very hard to model in synthetic images. And this problem, of course, was uh, known at the very beginning, uh, even in 2018, 2019. And some first solutions were proposed to deal with this domain shift problem by exploiting unsupervised domain adaptation. That means uh, we had some strategy allowing to fine tune a neural network on uh, a collection of uh, stereo images, even in absence of any ground truth depth annotation. And this was possible because uh, as soon as we have a stereo pair and we can estimate the disparity of this stereo pair, we can use the disparity itself to reproject one of the two images over the other one and measure the reprojection error that we get according to such a disparity map. We can use this simple error as a kind of self-supervised loss that can allow to increase the results even in absence of real uh, ground truth annotated images. So for what I say so far, we could think, uh, well, stereo was solved in 2020 because we had the domain shift issue. We had uh, some solutions to the issue. So why should we still work on stereo? Well, the answer is uh, that, of course, if we stopped there, we couldn't have some of the very good results that we will show you today through the tutorial. 
Indeed, I'm showing you an, an additional example from the Midderbury dataset, which, which is known as one of the most challenging dataset for this task. And here I'm showing the disparity maps we got from state-of-the-art models in 2019 and 2020, when these uh, networks were trained on synthetic datasets only. So you can figure out how the results were not good at all, they were lacking several details, and in presence of untextured regions, the results were completely wrong. And this is what we get nowadays. So if we take a state-of-the-art network uh, published between 2022 and today, if you train it on synthetic datasets only, you can get some very nice results, some very fine-grained disparity maps that are much, much better compared to what we have seen before the 20s. So basically, in these years, we, get, we got several improvements in terms of training practices and network designs, which are the main topics that we will cover today. So that being said, in this tutorial, we will uh, show you an overview of the most recent advances, and uh, we will also provide you some uh, uh, point of some of our own point of view. We will try to explain wh who's of the, which of these findings are those that really made the stereo matching advancing, and uh, this will be proved by the many approaches following this kind of pivotal works. And in the end, we will also see how stereo matching is nowadays very mature, and given the maturity of this task, we can also see, we can also look beyond the conventional color cameras, and we can think about running stereo networks also on some input modalities that are very different from color images, something that we, are, we, we couldn't even think about five years ago. So for instance, we will see how we can estimate the disparity between images of different modalities of different spectra. We can estimate dense disparity map out of sparse inputs, like the sparse inputs we get from event cameras. And we will also see how we can estimate the disparities in very challenging condition, as we can see in this picture, in which we have a very large no Lambertian surface that uh, until five years ago was something we couldn't even think possible to estimate correctly, while nowadays we can have some stereo networks capable of uh, properly figure out uh, the real surface uh, that we have uh, in this home. So just a, a little bit of additional information before we start. Uh, of course, uh, for wrapping up this tutorial, we reviewed the literature in the last uh, five years. And I must admit, when we started preparing the tutorial, we were thinking that uh, the paper were not that many. We, we said, uh, OK, yeah, we would have to see something like uh, 20 papers. That would be simple. The reality is that uh, there have been many, many more papers than, uh, than those we expected. So in the interest of time today, unfortunately, we will cover just a selection of all of this paper, because otherwise we will need a full day tutorial. And uh, nonetheless, uh, we collected uh, a complete overview of uh, all of the papers that we found out uh, in this uh, Hausum Deep Stereo uh, repository on GitHub. So here you have the QR code, you can access to the repo, you can find out everything we, uh, we scratched from the literature. And of course, you are also free to contribute because maybe in this uh, many amount of papers, we missed something. So that said, welcome on board, and we hope uh, you will enjoy our tutorial. So we are going to start uh, soon with uh, the architecture part. If you have some uh, quick question, maybe we can spend a couple of minutes for questions. Otherwise, uh, we can directly start uh, with the architectures, which will probably raise many questions uh, many more about the, many more with respect to the introduction. So I will also try to, in the interest of time, I will try to resume it a bit to be a little faster. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. And can you also confirm you can hear us from Seattle? Yes. Perfect, you... thank you very much. Okay, so this part will 
take about 40 minutes, something like that. And maybe after this part, uh, we can anticipate the break uh, to allow you for having a coffee. And uh, again, in this part, we will focus mostly on what really made the difference in the last five years. Because as you have seen in the introduction, we got uh, a very large improvement uh, with respect to everything we got uh, before the 20s, in particular in terms of uh, generalization and uh, robustness to the domain shifts. So just to give you an idea, since 2020, we counted more than 50 new stereo architectures. Here I'm showing you a list about uh, those uh, we were capable of fitting in this slide, but there are plenty more. And uh, all of them, again, you can find all of them in the House on Deep Stereo repository. Of course, today we are not gonna talk about all of them. So I'm very sorry if uh, any of the authors uh, uh, are uh, among the audience, any of the authors about, uh, uh, any of the authors of the architecture we won't talk about. I'm very sorry about this, but we can't really make it. So what we will try to do is to focus on uh, a few architectures that uh, in our opinion represented a, a, a paradigm shift in terms of architectural design. And we could identify two main architectures, which are rough stereo and the stereo transformer. And starting from them, then we will talk about some of the more recent architecture that took inspiration from either rough stereo or the stereo transformer, and we will discuss them. Finally, in orange, I'm highlighting some uh, deep stereo architecture that uh, are currently presented at CVPR 2024. So I will just mention them. They are very, very interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have the time for covering them, but I think that if you are in Seattle, you would uh, you have the chance to talk with the authors. That will be, of course, much, much better than asking our opinions about these architectures. So let's start uh, from uh, what we uh, reached uh, in uh, 2019 with our tutorials. So uh, in 2019, uh, most of the architectures were sharing uh, a common design. So all of these architecture at some point uh, through their uh, pipeline, through their uh, framework, were building something like a cost volume, which is the very basic uh, um, data structure that is usually built by a stereo algorithm to take uh, uh, to take into account the similarity or dissimilarities between the pixels on the left and the right image. And accordingly, the very first architectures uh, until uh, 2019 were based on this kind of cost volume. And depending on the way they built uh, this cost volume, we could identify two main subcategories. We dubbed all of them as CNN-based cost volume aggregation models. And depending on their specific implementation, we identified the 2D architectures and 3D architectures. From the names, you can already figure out what's the main difference between them. Anyway, we are going to recall it very, very quickly. In the first part of a stereo architecture is common to any stereo network. So usually given the two stereo images, we have a feature extractor that is usually implemented by a 2D uh, neural network that extracts some features from the either the left and the right image. Usually the same feature extractor is used for both, or actually we use two feature extractors sharing the same weights. So once we have extracted some features, we build the cost volume. The cost volume can be built depending on different strategies. The common strategy is, of course, to uh, compare the, each pixel on the left image with a certain number of pixels on the right image. In particular, we assume this number of uh, candidates as D, which is also the set of disparity hypothesis we are going to verify. And so given the cost volume, any entry in the volume at D, Y, X is basically obtained by combining features at Y, X, the left image, and Y, x minus d on the right image. For this purpose, we can either take the features and concatenate them to build a, uh, what we can call a, um, a matching vector, or we can take the features and compute some simple similarity or dissimilarity scores between the two. So for instance, we can subtract the features, we can 
compute the correlation as the dot product between the features. We can, some, we can run some more advanced correlation uh, functions like group-wise correlations, which basically takes the features, they split them into sub-vectors and computes the correlation between the corresponding sub-vectors and so on and so forth. Depending on the specific uh, function we are using, we might have different dimensionalities uh, for our cost volume. Indeed, uh, we can have uh, uh, volumes that are D times H times W. In the case we run, for instance, correlation, a correlation function. In this case, the volume uh, will be processed by a 2D convolutional neural network that will treat D as the channel dimension. On the contrary, we might have a more complex cost volume, which is made by F times D times H times W. This volume, as you can see, has an additional dimension, which is F. For instance, in the case we concatenate the features, we will have this dimension being double the amount of features we extract from the left and right image. So this volume, having an additional dimension, a dimension will be processed by 3D, convolu a 3D convolutional neural network. In the end, we will end up with a volume being a 1 times D times H times W with respect to what we got from 2D architectures, which were 1 times H times W. In the first case, which, with uh, this 3D cost volume, we can implement a differentiable winner takes all strategy, which is also known as, this, as the soft argmax layer, which basically takes the matching probability taken from this uh, volume, because each value is uh, uh, considered as a matching probability. And this probability is used to weight each of the disparity hypotheses and sum them up. So basically we are running a weighted average between the disparity hypotheses. This allows to implement a winner takes all strategy, selecting the most probable pixel while maintaining the possibility of running an end to end training. So the gradients will flow through this layer. In the case of 2D architectures, as soon as we get in the end one times H types times W volume, this is already what we will refer to as the disparity map. So we are simply regressing the disparity through a 2D neural network. So given these two differences, we get the 2D and the 3D architectures we were talking about before. However, in the last year, we got uh, new receipts for designing end-to-end uh, -end architectures. Two in particular emerged, as I anticipated before, one that has been proposed by Rough Stereo and one that has been proposed by the Stereo Transformer. And these two uh, are very different with respect to the CNN-based cost volume architecture because, as we will see, the former makes a very different use of the cost volume with respect to what we learned from 2D and 3D architectures. And the latter, in most cases, don't even build a cost volume at all. So we will see how these two approaches completely change the point of view of designing a deep steer architecture. Before introducing these new, these new categories, we will start from what we have seen um, after uh, our previous tutorials. So our previous tutorials covered uh, most of the deep architectures until uh, 2019. So we will start uh, um, by introducing the most advanced architectures uh, appeared in 2020. And uh, I'm introducing you mainly two architectures. One is uh, Lia Stereo and another one is CFNet. Lia Stereo has been published at the New Rips in 2020 and uh, is uh, very, very particular because it has been the very first attempt of using neural architecture search uh, uh, um, techniques to discover a brand new architecture to infra disparity map out of uh, stereo pairs. So what the authors did was to design the so-called search space for the architecture they were looking for. And at that time, the 3D architectures were the most popular among the stereo architectures. So basically they analyzed the structure of any 3D architectures and they, and they identified two main uh, learnable components. The feature net, which is the one in charge of uh, extracting the features, as I said before, and the matching net, which is the one in charge of processing the cost volume to obtain the final probability volume. So once they identified these two networks, they basically designed two different search spaces, 
one for the feature net and one for the matching net. Of course, the first one was, will be mainly composed of uh, 2D convolutional layers, while the second one will be composed mainly of 3D convolutional layers. So once they define this search space, they simply uh, train the uh, the search of the architecture. And once the, be the best architecture is found, they train it end-to-end. More in particular, the search spaces that are defined can be defined at two different levels. One is the cell level, which defines the basic components inside either the feature net and the matching net. And the other one is the network level, which basically defines the overall, overall skeleton of each of the two networks that will be, of course, selected accordingly to the outcome of the neural architecture search. So for the cell levels, of course, for the feature net, we will have mainly uh, three by three convolutions with skip connections, while for the matching net, we will have three by three by three convolutions and skip connections. While for the network space, the authors simply needs to define the maximum amount of cells we want and the lowest resolution that uh, the features could reach uh, across uh, computation. Then the network uh, is searched and trained uh, with a simple smooth L1 loss. That is something that was very popular in 2019. And uh, these pictures shows basically the overall architecture that have been found by the Elias Stereo authors. So we can see that is something very uncommon with respect to the architectures existing at that time, because at that time, both uh, the feature net and the matching net were basically composed as units. So we had the resolution going down and then going up again, while here we can figure out how we just go up and down multiple times. So this is a design very, very unlikely for a human to be proposed from scratch. The second one is CFNet and has been published at CBPR 2021. And CFNet uses a uh, quite uh, simple, I would say, course to fine design, which was very popular already at that time. Nonetheless, CFNet is uh, particularly important because uh, it uh, was the winner of the 2020 Robust Vision Challenge. That uh, is a challenge in which uh, the participants were asked to train a single stereo network capable of performing the best on any of the existing stereo benchmarks, so respectively Kitty, Midabury, and ETH3D. And at that time, CFNet was the absolute winner. And with respect to a classical course to fine uh, structure, of course, made of uh, uh, 3D modules, the main novelties introduced by CFNet are uh, the fusion of multiple cost volumes across uh, different resolutions and uh, the modeling of the uncertainty for each of the disparity maps predicted at the different resolutions. And this uncertainty is used to uh, basically adjust the search range being used at any of the levels in the, pyram in the pyramid. And just to be a little more precise, so the very first disparity map uh, uh, predicted by CFNet was predicted at one height of the resolution, but this was uh, also obtained by merging some cost volumes obtained even a lower resolution. So they got one sixteenth and one thirty two resolution cost volumes that were uh, combined together and processed by a three D encoder decoder module. And this gave the very first uh, uh, disparity map at the lowest stage. Then this uh, disparity map was upsampled and used to warp the features and build a compact cost volume for estimating a disparity map at a, high, at a slightly higher resolution. And usually when we do this, we only search for the disparity into a reduced uh, disparity range. This disparity range is usually fixed, or at least uh, it was before CFNet. CFNet proposed to uh, measure the uncertainty of the disparity predicted by the 3D modules by simply measuring the distance from each disparity candidate to the picked disparity and multiply this by the matching probability. So this means that if we have multiple high, high, highly probable uh, disparity indexes, we will have a high uncertainty. While if we have a single picked value, we will have uncertainty equal to zero. So given this uncertainty, the uncertainty was used to adjust the search range at the higher resolution. This means if we have a, a very uncertainty prediction from the previous stage, we will need to enlarge our 
uh, disparity search range a little more because probably our current prediction is very far from the correct one. On the contrary, if our prediction is uh, as a very low uncertainty, probably it is enough to look to look at a very narrow disparity range. So this was uh, what uh, uh, came out uh, before uh, uh, the very first uh, uh, groundbreaking network designs that we are going to see from now on. So we are going to talk about, uh, again, these two families. We refer to the former as the iterative or optimization-inspired uh, architectures, and we will refer to the second as to the transformer-based architectures. Starting from this one, this category uh, has been uh, uh, proposed for the very first time by Raf Stereo. Raf Stereo was published at 3DV 2021. And the Raf Stereo is uh, an end to end architecture for dense disparity estimation that was uh, highly inspired by Raft, which was uh, uh, an architecture proposed for estimating dense optical flow from a pair of images. And the Raf Stereo may basically follows the main architectural design uh, proposed by the original raft and this architectural design the, uh, the this architectural design uh, proposes a new way of fusing the cost volume indeed we will see that uh, in place of computing the cost volume by matching pixels on the left image with a certain amount of candidates on the right image the very first novelty concerns into computing the matching cost across all of the pixels between the left and the right images. This allows this architecture to have a potentially unbound disparity range, allowing it to be very, very robust to very different disparity distributions that we might find at testing time. Indeed, for all of the architectures that were proposed before, we usually add a fixed disparity range that was usually 192. And if, at deployment time, we were facing some uh, images with a disparity range being uh, higher than this bound. The architecture itself was not capable of dealing with uh, these specific disparities. In this case, uh, by unbounding uh, the disparity search range, rough stereo itself is potentially capable of uh, handling any kind of uh, disparity distribution. And this is the very first uh, innovation introduced by rough stereo. The second one is that this uh, cost volume that we will call as all pair correlation volume is no longer optimized by a 3D architecture or a 2D architecture, but, but it is used as guidance. So we will see this cost volume is used to guide an iterative estimation of the disparity and an iterative refinement along time. So, before we talk about this, uh, here I'm showing you the code for implementing the correlation layer used by Raf Stereo, producing this kind of all pairs correlation uh, uh, volume. And given the nature of this uh, uh, operation, this can be implemented very conveniently by means of a very simple matrix multiplication. Indeed, if we assume our features are batch times times uh, D, which is the amount of features, times H times W, then we will have, again, another feature map of the same dimensionality. We can rearrange these features in order to have two, matrix, two matrices compatible for matrix multiplication. In particular, we will have something like W times uh, BDH, and we will have BDH times W. So given these two uh, tensors, we can run a single matrix multiplication, which is much more efficient than any cost volume operation proposed before and allows, and allows us to obtain a cost volume with very, very low computational efforts. So once this correlation volume is built, we also have some additional hyperparameters, which are the number of levels and the radius. In particular, the number of levels define something like a course to find approach to access to the cost volume. We will see that the cost volume is accessed either at, at its original resolution, as well as at two additional resolution being downsampled by a factor two and four. And the radius, which is basically uh, telling us to how many uh, cost we are accessing at any time we access to our cost volume. But we will figure this out uh, a little better in a few minutes. So 
Once the cost volume is built, rough stereo, as I, as I told before, is not going to optimize this cost volume, but it is rather going to use this as a guidance. This means rough stereo as an internal state, which is the disparity map itself. It is initialized to zero, so we start from a zero disparity map. And given the disparity values for each pixel, we access to the cost volume at that specific disparity hypothesis. Then by accessing the cost volume, we sample some of the matching cost from the pixel itself and some of the neighbors. And these neighbors are defined, of course, by the radius hyperparameter I was referring before. So we sample these matching cost and we forward them to a iterative neural network. In particular, we have a neural network that is composed of gated recurrent unit. And this gated recurrent unit takes this cost sampled by the correlation volume and some additional features. So this way, we have this uh, gated recurrent unit module that takes uh, some features extracted from the left image and the matching cost. And given these features, it predicts a, a disparity update to be summed to the current state of the rough stereo disparity map. So at the very beginning, we will basically find an initial disparity that we sum to the zero disparity. Then once we have updated this internal state, we use this new disparity map to access again the cost volume. So the cost volume now will not be accessed at the zero disparity hypothesis, but will be accessed at the current hypothesis that the GRU were predicting. So we sample new costs from the cost volume, we forward them to the GRU, and the GRU predicts an additional offset to be added to the current state of the disparity map. In other words, what we are doing, we are navigating through the cost volume until we find the global minima that we have for a given pixel. And this is done by simply looking along the cost volume and having this network basically predicting some update direction to which we will navigate further at the next iteration. So given this mechanism, rough stereo fixes a certain amount of iteration that we run at uh, both a training time and a difference time. And after a certain amount of iter iteration, our internal state will converge to an accurate disparity map. So this is the code. Uh, I was uh, supposed to talk a little more about the code, but the interest of, in the interest of time, uh, I won't go into the details. And uh, just uh, it is just worth mentioning that the cost volume is built uh, at uh, quarter resolution. So the disparity we estimate is at quarter resolution. However, from uh, the original raft, uh, the authors implemented uh, the so-called uh, complex upsampling uh, procedure, which basically predicts uh, some kind of uh, weights to be used for interpolating the current pixels in the disparity map and upsample the disparity map up to the full resolution. In this picture, I'm going to show you a more intuitive, uh, in a more intuitive way, the mechanism behind rough stereo. So, let, so let's assume we have a left image in which we have the blue pixel here, and we have a right image in which we have the blue pixel here. So let's say at a disparity equal to seven. So rough stereo works by building the cost volume and at the very first iteration, we will sample the cost volume assuming the zero disparity hypothesis. Then we sample the cost, we process them with the GRU, and we estimate a disparity update. This disparity update will move us here. So right now, our current disparity prediction for the pixel is two. So once we access to the cost volume again, we will sample the pixels from the disparity hypothesis two, together with some neighbors. Okay. Then the GRU will process this cost and will update again the current disparity estimate, moving them by two additional pixels. We will sample again the pixels here. We will move again here. Now we are very close to our final solution. This means at the next iteration, we are very likely to sample the cost volumes from the real minima, the real minima, and then we will be ready to provide an accurate disparity map. And here we have some qualitative results. At the time of uh, publication, Rough Stereo was the state of the art on the Middlebury dataset and was capable of uh, predicting much more fine results, much finer uh, predictions, as we can notice here on the bicycle. 
And here at the very bottom, we can see the error, the the one, the, the bad one error, sorry, with respect to existing architecture, such as Lia Stereo, for instance. So you can figure out how Rough Stereo was capable of uh, alphing the error with respect of Lia Stereo, and also with respect to more recent architectures like, like uh, Ethernet, uh, which unfortunately we don't have the time uh, to cover in this tutorial. And given the advances uh, produced by Rough Stereo, then uh, many other architectures were proposed following this path. And uh, the very first uh, coming out after Rough Stereo was uh, Chris Stereo at CPR 2022. Chris Stereo followed the very same iterative scheme proposed by Rough Stereo, yet with some uh, large differences. The very first one was that Chris Stereo authors enriched the feature extractor by adding some positional encodings in uh, when extracting the features and by adding some self-attention mechanism again when extracting the features from the left and the right images. Then another uh, large difference consists uh, into the absence of a low, uh, of a global cost volume, like the one we have seen for rough stereo. So Chris stereo no longer builds a single global cost volume, but it builds a local tiny cost volume. That means uh, at any time, given the current state of Chris stereo, so the current disparity map, uh, we take the left features, we sample some features from the right image, and we use only these sample features to build a local cost volume. Then this cost volume is processed by the so-called RUM, which are, again, some recurrent, uh, recurrent neural networks, which estimate an update to be added to the current disparity estimate. Then at each iteration, we sample again new features, we build a new cost volume, and then we estimate the disparity map again. So this means differently from Rust Stereo, at any iteration, Chris Stereo builds a compact cost volume. But of course, the cost volume is quite compact, so the effort is not that large. Finally, at inference time, Chris Stereo also proposed to run inference on a pyramid of stereo images. This means the Stereo images are downsampled and processed by Rough Stereo one time, one first time. Rough Stereo iteratively provides a disparity map. This disparity map is upsampled and then is used as the initial state for a second inference of Chris Stereo itself on a new uh, on the on the new pair. This time at full resolution. So basically, we run Chris Stereo twice once at low resolution to get an initial state, and once at high resolution, starting from the previous inference. And uh, for this, uh, the authors proposed uh, what they call uh, the adaptive group correlation layer, which means uh, given the internal state uh, uh, by Chris Stereo, they sample the features and they build uh, this uh, compact cost volume according to group-wise correlation layers and uh, by also computing cross-attention between the left and right features. Furthermore, in order to be robust to uh, miscalibration of the stereo camera or inaccurate rectification, the cost volumes were also built by taking into account some uh, vertical shifts uh, along the horizontal axis. This means we, if we have uh, imperfectly rectified images in which the pixels are not exactly on the same horizontal line, well, the cost volume will still be meaningful because we are taking into account uh, for these uh, possible shifts. And here we see some qualitative results compared to rough stereo. Chris Stereo is capable of uh, further improving the results uh, in presence of fine details. And an additional reason about these very good results uh, is also related to the to a synthetic data set that the authors proposed together with the architecture that collects many, many images with very fine details, of course, annotated with perfect ground truth. So this, of course, also made a difference for training a Chris Stereo at the very best. Then last year, we got IGF Stereo at CVPR 2023, which is uh, with respect to Chris Stereo, it is uh, much uh, closer to Rough Stereo because uh, it still computes uh, a global cost volume. It still uh, updates an initial disparity map by sampling the matching cost from the global uh, correlation table. 
And uh, the main difference introduced by iGAF Stereo is uh, the use of uh, a 3D neural network processing uh, an initial 4D cost volume. Indeed, the authors claims that despite the uh, the iterative mechanism implemented by, by RAF Stereo is still powerful, is very powerful. A 3D neural network is very, very strong at producing an initial disparity map. So the authors uh, said, why not? Why don't we build some kind of uh, 4D cost volume? We implement a compact 3D architecture to obtain an initial disparity map from this volume. And then we use this initial disparity map as the initial state for, of course, refining it through the iterative uh, procedure proposed by Rav Stereo. And again, since we are building a 4D cost volume and we are refining it to obtain a first disparity map, this cost volume could also be used by uh, together with the all pair correlation. So. This time, I give stereo differently from a stereo samples the matching cost both from the all pair correlation table as well as from this geometry cost volume built in the form of the 4D cost volume that were used by the 3D architectures. And uh, here we can appreciate some qualitative results. Again, in comparison with rough stereo, we can notice how at the very top we have rough stereo here we have i give stereo we can appreciate how the details uh, that the high give stereo is capable of uh, uh, recovering are much much uh, higher with respect to rough stereo then uh, in parallel to i give stereo uh, we also got uh, another architecture that, which is uh, called the lnr and uh, it is uh, it has been proposed to deal with the high frequency details. Indeed, despite everything we have said so far, as soon as we extract some features that are downsampled during the extraction process, of course, as soon as we downsample, we lose some details. So this uh, architecture proposed a slightly different approach consisting of using pixel unshuffling to simply split the pixels in the image into four sets and extract the features from these sets independently. Then combining these features basically allows to maintain the full information from the initial pixels while not losing the original resolution. Of course, this kind of a shuffling is enough for reducing the complexity in the complexity in a way similar to what we do when we downsample the features. Together with this, uh, the authors also proposed a slightly improved uh, GRU by decoupling the internal state of the gated recurrent unit and the disparity state itself by having two distinct uh, hidden states. And this proved to be a little more effective when propagating the updates uh, for the disparity map. Finally, the authors also proposed a, refine, a refinement module that given the prediction by the first iterative network, simply take the initial disparity map, normalizes it into 0, 1, refines this disparity map by means of uh, 2D convolutions, and finally, unnormalize these predictions. And this refinement is also based on the reprojection error obtained from the initial disparity map, and of course, using the left and right image by reprojecting the right over the left. Here again, we can uh, see some qualitative results uh, with respect to Cristerio and uh, other architecture that, again, unfortunately, we cannot cover today. And you can notice how the error rate is, in general, uh, much lower compared to existing approaches. We are getting close to the end of this first family of architecture. I'm sorry for being that uh, long and that dense. Uh, so. At ICCV 2023, so the very last conference, the very last top conference before CVPR, we got also PCVNet, which is basically an architecture again inspired by rough stereo, but uh, um, modeling the uh, cost volume uh, and the disparity maps uh, in particular uh, according to mixtures of Gaussians. So this allows for uh, uh, retrieving the informations uh, according to a more compact representation, which is those, of course, of the uh, mixture of Gaussians. So by simply modeling the means and the variance of the Gaussians, we can access to 
the uh, the correlation uh, table and uh, of course we can iteratively update uh, this mixture of Gaussians so with respect to the original rough stereo now the GRU will not predict uh, a disparity update but will predict an update for the means uh, the variances and uh, the alpha factors of the mixture of Gaussians and again this solution uh, uh, proved to be very, very effectively, in particular on some very challenging images on the Midelbury dataset. Here we can notice, uh, as in a direct comparison with rough stereo, how the proposed uh, PCV net uh, is much more accurate uh, in the presence of large untextured regions, uh, or in particular also in the presence of occlusions like the left border we have here. So, this one is the very last and uh, is going to be uh, this is going, is going to be presented at CPR in the next days so I, so I encourage you to if you are interested to visit the poster and talk directly with the authors and this is uh, the only only CVPR 2024 paper we are mentioning a little more in detail because it is directly related to rough stereo. While the other papers uh, I mentioned at the beginning that will be presented at CVPR 2024 are not entirely related to this architecture. So we, ju we will just mention them at the very end. And this architecture is called the selective stereo and uh, basically revises uh, the mechanism already implemented by rough stereo and uh, IGF stereo by simply learning to select the most meaningful context feature extracted from the left image and to be used during the iterative process for refining the disparity map. So given these uh, uh, most meaningful features uh, we can extract uh, basically the network is designed to extract uh, some kind of attention maps at different resolutions and these attention maps are used to guide the iterative uh, uh, procedure so the gated recurrent unit are now the gated recurrent unit are now implemented as selective recurrent units that takes as input these uh, contextual special attention and uses them basically to filter out uh, the features. So for uh, those pixels, for those features having uh, a very low attention score, these uh, will not be, will be ignored, will be very likely to be ignored during the iterative uh, update in order to propagate only the most meaningful information. And here again, we can see some qualitative results, respectively against the rough stereo and IGEV stereo. We can see that selective rough and selective IGEV can obtain even more uh, accurate results and even more fine grained predictions. So that's all for the first family of architectures, those inspired by rough stereo. Now we will go very quickly on over the transformer-based architectures. And then in the end, I will leave you time for questions, of course. Sorry for being uh, that fast, but yeah, we're trying to just uh, catch back some time. So this second family, that is the transformer-based family, uh, was introduced by the Stereo Transformer paper, which was published at ICCV 2021. So I would say almost in parallel to rough stereo. And uh, the very big uh, news about this paper is that uh, in this architecture, no cost volume is built at all. Indeed, we have a feature extractor that is made again by standard convolutional layers. And the features extracted from the left and the right image are then processed by a transformer. So this transformer is basically implemented as a sequence of self-attention and cross-attention layers that we will see in a while. And given the attention maps that are extracted from the transformer, we can estimate both the matching between the left and the right features, as well as some kind of occlusion map in particular, in, uh, for those uh, pixels or for those tokens for which a strong uh, similar candidate cannot be, find, cannot be found across the entire search range. So just going a little more in detail, once we have the features, this transformer block uh, consists of uh, a set of alternate self-attention layers and cross-attention layers. The former, of course, uh, computing attention across the features on the same image and the, the latter computed the attention across the left and the right features. 
This sequence of layers is repeated multiple times, and uh, this allows for obtaining some attention maps. These attention maps can be uh, treated as some as some matching probabilities. And uh, the good point of computing cross attention between uh, tokens is that uh, similarly to rough stereo, again, here we are no longer bound to a disparity search range. In particular, since we compute the attention between uh, a token on the left image and all of the tokens on the right image, we could possibly estimate disparity up to any disparity distribution. Of course, this can be uh, this can be used. This attention map can be used as matching probability. But before that, since these probability are very coarse, the authors propose to use an optimal transport layer to refine and improve the probabilities probabilities obtained from the attention maps. And here again, I was supposed to. Uh, dive a little more into the code, but in the interest of time, unfortunately, we can't. Uh, I will just uh, show you here we have the self-attention, here we have the cross-attention. And uh, finally, here we have also a reference for the optimal transport layer. And once we get the attention maps, uh, we can uh, obtain an initial disparity map by simply looking for each token at the highest attention score and uh, to its neighbors. So if we take the highest the highest attention score and the neighbors, we then, we then can compute the soft arg max between them and obtain the initial disparity. At the same time, if we sum up all of the attention score for a single token, we can obtain some, uh, some measure of uh, the uncertainty we have for that token. In particular, if uh, all of the attention score course are very low for that token, we can sum them up and then we can revert this sum. So we can have something like a normalized sum, then we can do one minus this sum. And uh, this way, if uh, the value we obtain is very, very high, it is uh, very likely that this specific token don't have a matching token on the right image. So this also means we are dealing with an occlusion or some kind of uh, pattern that is not visible on the right view. For instance, we are dealing with a token on the left border. Finally, after we have obtained an initial disparity map and an occlusion mask, uh, the authors also uh, designed a refinement network that takes the normalized disparity map. Again, this is normalized in 0, 1. And then, uh, sorry, no, this time is normalized to have 0 mean and uh, 1 standard, devi and standard deviation equal to 1. And then a 2D convolutional neural network refines this disparity map that, uh, in the end, is then unnormalized. So we use, again, the mean and the variance to put it back to the original uh, disparity range. Here we can see some qualitative results. Uh, we can appreciate how the disparity predictions are very, very accurate and how the occlusions are properly detected by uh, the occlusion mask obtained from the attention maps. Of course, one of the main issues by the disparity map we get from the attention maps is that it is not capable of predicting the disparity for those tokens that are not matched across the images. This is why the authors also proposed a refinement network to fill, basically, the occlusions. And the stereo transformer as well uh, started a new trend of uh, new architectures that follow this path. Uh, the very first, what uh, the context announced, the stereo transformer published at ECCV 2022, that has as the main novelties the use of axial attention in place of self attention and the introduction of uh, the so called context enhanced path, that is basically a path processing features at a much lower resolution. So the features we get from the feature extractor are. Uh, pulled at a lower resolution and then are processed by this context enhanced path. This allows to increase the context uh, and the perceptive field of the stereo transformer itself. And these features are then merged with the features extracted by the main matching path, which is actually the original path used by the stereo transformer, in order to have more meaningful information and estimate a more accurate disparity map. 
And as we can appreciate from the qualitative results, we can see the context enhanced path is very helpful at dealing with those large untextured regions that were very hard for the original stereo transformer. Then at ICCV 2023, we had ELFNET, which is another architecture extending the stereo transformer. And basically, ELFNET proposes a few main differences. The first one is to model disparities, uh, uh, disparity distribution this way as a mixture of normal inverse gamma distributions. So the stereo transformer is no longer estimating directly some disparity values, but it is estimating the values of this kind of mixtures of distributions. And this mixture is made of two main components, a local and a global component. The local component is obtained by a local branch that builds uh, an old-fashioned 4D cost volume and processes it with a 3D convolutional neural network, similarly to what IGEV Stereo did with respect to rough stereo. And this 3D network predicts, of course, uh, the, um, the parameters of the local uh, normal inverse gamma distribution. For what concerns the global, uh, the global branch, uh, the global branch, it is modeled uh, again from uh, the stereo transformer features. This time being adapted to regress uncertainties in place of occlusion probabilities. So these uncertainties can be used again in this formulation of the mixture of normal inverse gamma distributions. And here we can show some qualitative results directly taken from the paper. Despite being on, synthetic, on the synthetic uh, data set on scene flow, we can appreciate how the predictions are very, very accurate. And at the same time, the stereo transformer is very good at estimating its own uncertainty this time. We are going to conclude with uh, two additional uh, transformer-based architectures. These are not directly related to the stereo transformer, but uh, they still make use uh, of transformers. One is a Croco Stereo, published at ICCV 2023. Again, Croco Stereo builds uh, over uh, a transformer that has been pre-trained over a very strong pre-text task. task. And uh, in particular, the Crocos Stereo Transformer has been trained, uh, has been pre-trained to process the so-called cross-image completion task. This means uh, that we need a data set in which we have pair of images with a good overlap, but not uh, uh, necessarily being rectificated. And then given a, pair, a single pair of image, we have a reference image that is processed uh, entirely by the transformer and the reference image that is masked, as we can see here on the top right. So given the unmasked reference image and the masked target image, the transformer is asked to basically predict and complete the original uh, target view. So basically, it is asked to complete the masked image. It is, it is uh, processing a training time. So after this, Pre-training being carried out on a very, very large data set, then this transformer is fine-tuned by adding a decoder. This decoder is inspired by the dense prediction transformer module proposed by the DPT paper. And this uh, decoder uh, is used to upsample the tokens extracted by the decoder of the transformer and convert them into disparity, basically into disparity labels. Again, this stereo transformer does not compute any cost volume at all. To some extent, we can see we can say this is uh, even farther from the cost volume with respect to the stereo transformers we, we saw before, because to some extent, the attention maps uh, uh, for the stereo transformer add the role of the cost volume, more or less. So here are some qualitative results. We can see how Crocus Stereo produce uh, some uh, very accurate results, but in some uh, very challenging conditions with repeated occlusions, it seems not the very best uh, choice with respect to, to Crest Stereo. Nonetheless, we feel that these results are, are very, very impressive, considering that no matching between uh, the tokens is imposed at all. And to conclude, we also mentioned GM Stereo, also known as Unimatch, that was published at uh, Tipami last year. 
And uh, Unimatch, uh, we will refer to this as Unimatch because Unimatch has been proposed as a unified architecture for uh, carrying out two-frame dense matching task. This means Unimatch is capable of predicting optical flow from uh, two arbitrary images or a disparity map out of rectified stereo images or even the depth map out of two posed images. And uh, the winning choice be behind uh, Unimatch is the use, uh, again, of some uh, CNN-based feature extractors. Then the features are processed by a transformer, again, alternating self-attention with cross-attention. And uh, the features uh, that we get uh, after the stereo transformer are very, very strong and very, very meaningful of the matching task. This means that from these features, this time uh, Unimatch computes a cost volume differently from the other transformers. And this cost volume is uh, accurate enough for allowing to predict uh, the disparity map by simply running a winner-takes-all strategy. Of course, uh, Unimatch also proposes to optionally refine the disparity map we take out of this uh, very single uh, access to the cost volume by implementing an iterative refinement very close to the one proposed by Raft. Nonetheless, given the very strong features extracted by Unimatch, we can see in this plot how after the very first iteration, Unimatch has an error that is already very, very competitive with Raft and Raft Stereo for the Stereo case. After Raft has run all of each, all of the iteration to be, to be run at test time. Then given this very good initial prediction, a single iteration is enough for greatly outperforming the original, the original raft and rough stereo. And here to conclude, we can see some qualitative results again on the mid data dataset, showing the much better results in presence of fine details and occlusions that Unimatch achieves with respect to rough stereo and Chris stereo. So that's all for the architectures we wanted to talk about. Now we will mention three more papers that are worth to be seen at CVPR if you are there in person. The first one is Mocha Stereo, which is again an iterative architecture based on Rough Stereo and is further improving over Rough Stereo. As we can notice from the qualitative results, we can see here, Mocha Stereo provides some very strong details, uh, even compared with IGF Stereo, as we can appreciate on the wheel of this of, of uh, this bicycle. Another one is uh, ICGNet, which basically exploits uh, both uh, intraview and uh, cross-view uh, knowledge about the matching task to improve uh, the stereo matching task. And here we can show we can see some results of ICGNet uh, on the Kitty and Middlebury dataset with respect to IGF Stereo. We can appreciate how their proposal can still boost the accuracy a little further. And finally, we also would like to mention the NMR AF architecture that uh, again will be presented at CVPR. And this is a very, very interesting approach because it's completely different from anything we have seen today or in the previous tutorials. And uh, this is basically built on a combination of uh, some conventional CNN for extracting features and some neural Markov random, Mark random field uh, framework being used for inferring the disparity map. And here again, uh, I'm showing you some qualitative results uh, on uh, SceneFlow and Kitty. And uh, yeah, from our side, uh, we suggest you to visit the posters for both for any of these three papers, as well as for the fourth that we mentioned among the rough stereo inspired architectures. So that's all for this first part. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, this is a good time for taking question. I think there are two questions in the chat, Matteo. Okay. Okay, so I will go over the very first one by Jiri Matas. Thanks for asking. So in the evaluation, how are the pixel visible in only one of the two images handled? Uh, not sure what do you refer about? Uh, maybe the stereo transformer? I don't know. Feel free to clarify, Jiri. Well, uh, 
uh, there is answer here. Would you please come here? And also we are like 28 minutes into the break, just to know. Okay. So if you have a stereo pair, some of the yeah. images will be included in the left, left on the right image. So some 3D pixels will be visible only in one of yeah. the two images. So what is the ground truth for that and how are they handled in the evaluation? Because I think it's critical that the evaluation, if it's ignored, uh, includes these pixels and they require an occlusion mask calculation. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Usually, well, this depends a lot uh, on the on the data set. Yeah, if you collect the data, usually if you collect the data set with uh, uh, an active sensor and you are capable of reducing the occlusions between the sensor and the images themselves, you can probably provide some accurate uh, okay, ground truth. Is what is done in the tables you've shown? Something. Oh, happened. sorry, sorry. So, or even here, like if you look at any of those things, like the bike. Okay, so oh, okay, okay. Parts yeah, yeah. of the bike, which is not visible in the left image, the occlusion, the bike is occluding something on the background. And it seems like you can you can see it for the ground truth that there is uh, black parts in the ground. Yeah, truth. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. But got now, it, got incorrectly, it. all the methods are predicting something in the black part of the ground truth, and you don't punish them. And yeah. they can predict whatever they want which is bad because if you do this in a say uh, a self driving car uh, instead of saying i don't know this is ground truth is saying i don't know i don't see this in the two images you say well you can output whatever and it will not be punished yeah so yeah, yeah okay okay GoPro is is outputting something in those black parts and all of them are outputting something because they are never trained to say i don't know or occlusion yeah that's a good point and uh, actually this is what the transformer architectures try to do because basically they produce this occlusion mask that basically looks at uh, where you cannot match anything at all and so as you can see here in this picture in the prediction basically the occlusions are masked so this kind of architecture to some extent uh, admit that they cannot provide a prediction there this is good but then when you do the scoring and someone you say something is better and something is worse you should take that into account so yeah, you show it here, but then you ignore it in the tables, which is not good. Yeah, that's right. I agree. And uh, for this, let's say one of the possible solutions so far is to use some of the most recent synthetic data sets, because you know you have a perfect ground truth there. And if you evaluate there, of course, you take this into account, but you know synthetic images are much simpler. So yeah, I think this but is a way. Look, you, you we show some examples where the ground truth knew where the occlusion was. It was marked in the ground truth. It's not the issue of the ground truth. It's the it's the community ignoring an important effect and says saying if the disparity cannot be calculated, you should tell me. And the community accepts, like in the evaluation, saying you can output whatever you want. You see it on those results, and I think that leads optimization of the methods in the wrong direction okay. so in yeah, the yeah, yeah. you have the uh, if you have it marked it's not a problem of ground truth okay i'll leave yeah. it here yeah 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 I, I see your point yeah actually you're right yeah 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 this is something at some point should be yeah should be improved or at least deal with yeah thank you very much And I'm also going on uh, another question I see in the chat, and then uh, maybe this is a good time for having the break in Seattle. Can you confirm? Yes, uh, we are already half an hour into the break. Uh, so Okay, uh, so I will answer this question, and then we can have a 15-minute break. Okay. So do you need a pair of stereo images in all of the stereo algorithm you discussed? Yes. Yeah. All of the architecture we have shown here are basically processing stereo pairs. So we are not going to see any monocular depth network in this tutorial. OK. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, that can uh, because um, um, can uh, questions be answered later or ask questions after the break? Yeah, or as as you prefer. Audience. 
Okay. So you want to break now and then uh, when uh, come back at the hour. So it's a shorter break. Yeah, or maybe maybe we the whole hour. maybe we can resume at uh, yeah ten fifty something like this. Ten fifty. Well, the break is until eleven. So you want. Okay, yeah, maybe we can, yeah, we can resume just at 11, okay. Okay, at 11, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. if some people from the audience want to talk during the break feel free to to ask us actually i will be here at the pc so don't worry to ask Hi, Matteo. This is Edward. Can you hear me? Hi, sure. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of new in this uh, machine learning uh, based uh, stereo matching. Um, what I know is like traditional matching um, by using correlation stuff. So uh, I have a question. In I've heard about the MIDAS, uh, basically using machine learning based uh, system to understand the relative depth and for that is monocular algorithm, I guess. And yeah. for all the algorithm you're um, saying, you mentioned it is all for a pair of stereo images. And I'm sure you're getting the absolute depth, right? You're not just calculating the relative depth because you know the baseline. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you are getting the disparity as you, as you get it from uh, any stereo algorithm. So you get the disparity okay. if you know, of course, the baselines and you can uh, triangulate into depth. Yeah. Right. Okay. That that is basically what you miss uh, when you have some kind of relative depth from uh, the single image approaches. In principle, you could also retrieve metric depth, but you would need to know the missing scale that in that case you don't know. So yeah. I see. You can see yeah, you need some reference there. Yeah, the exactly. Repo. Um okay. I have another question. Sure. Suppose in most of the images you share with us or in most of the stereo matching uh, examples that people show, typically the object distance are much farther compared to the baseline. Let's say if my baseline is about, I don't know, five centimeters and typically yeah. the object is like in the room or the scene of the world. But if I have an object about 10 centimeter away, from the camera, stereo camera, and my baseline is like 10 centimeter also, there will be a lot of distortion between the left image and the right image. Are this, this I assume is a problem because 
it will be difficult to correlate between the between, to correlate between the left and right images, right? But are these algorithms able to handle those? Yeah, that's correct. This, of course, is uh, much more challenging, and in particular, you might even have uh, a large part of the content uh, from the left Occluded. image uh, being out of the right image. So. Mm -hmm. And in principle, yeah, these kind of approaches uh, are basically trained to match patterns. Mm, one possible issue some of these uh, might have, uh, and this is something we didn't discuss directly, but this is a possible problem. Mm -hmm. all, all, since all of these approaches are uh, based on training data, uh, it would be better to have, uh, mm, let's say, a distribution of the disparities in your training data that is large enough and meaningful enough of what you, you could get in the real world. So, for instance, if we assume in your setting you have a very large baseline, so you might have disparities between, let's say, 300 and 600, okay? Mm -hmm. If your model has not been trained on... Uh, on some kind of data having these properties, uh, it will mm -hmm. probably fail at dealing with this. But if you train it uh, properly, and uh, nowadays uh, there are plenty of data sets, there are plenty of uh, um, plenty of uh, procedures also for augmenting your data. If you train it properly, in principle, it is capable of dealing with this. Of course, you would also have larger occlusions. When you have the occlusions, uh, you don't really know what you are matching. So yeah, in, in principle, yes, but of course it's uh, more challenging. Got it, thank you. I think there's another no question there in the write-up. Okay, I see a question in the chat. Uh, it seems there's an assumption about the view difference only exists in the horizontal plane. Yeah, we have, yeah, right. Is there any method data set looking into more challenging stereo setup? Okay, let's say there are there's a, at least one data set that provides uh, uh, images taken uh, over a, a cross pattern, let's say. So we have a, a center view, then we have uh, one image on the left, one image on the right, one image on the top, and one at the bottom. So in principle, you have up to five images. And this data set is called multiscopic, I see. I see. Yes, yes, a multiscopic stereo. Okay, yeah, great, great. thanks, Fabio. And uh, again, for this data set, uh, the pixels are always aligned between the center and any of the other views, but of course, in diff according to different patterns. So with respect to the left and right images, they are aligned uh, on the horizontal uh, axis, uh, while, uh, uh, sorry, they are aligned on the vertical axis, so they shift uh, over the horizontal axis. For the top and bottom images, it is uh, the opposite. So the images are at the same X coordinate and they move uh, on the Y coordinate. More in general, uh, there's another field, uh, uh, another research uh, topic, which is known as multi-view stereo, in which you have multiple images and they are not bound to be aligned either on vertical or horizontal lines. So let's say multi-view stereo is a more general task in this sense. And uh, of course it is also more challenging. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. I don't know if this, an this uh, answers your question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, can you also share the name uh, in the chat? Uh, I was trying to search it, didn't find it. But yeah, thanks. I, I, that would be uh, more interesting uh, to... I can search it for you. Uh, yeah, maybe we can also share the link. Yeah, sure. Just uh, show the, the paper link. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, great. Thanks. You're welcome. Fabio, if you can uh, back up me for a while, I'm grabbing some food and I'll be back. Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. You're welcome.
Hey Fabio, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, I think Matteo mentioned about the algorithm requires the stereo images to be orthographic, or I don't know, maybe I misheard it. Uh, what if they're like perspective images? Well, I'm sorry, can you repeat again, sorry? Um, what Matteo is... mentioned in the beginning that the images, the stereo images yeah. was orthographic, means like, I think it's far distance, they're, right? They're uh, rectified. So the, the assumption is that the stereo images are rectified. Rectified. Oh, does it? Uh, why? Why do you need it to be rectified? Because it simplifies the problem. You, if you rectify the uh, the images, you uh, need to, to find correspondences along a horizontal line. It's a one D correspondence problem. Otherwise, it is much uh, more complex. You need to find across the two D space rather than the one D uh, horizontal line. In that case, you need to know the camera intrinsic yeah, parameters. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You see, and if you just um, input whatever the raw images from the camera, it won't work as well. Um, no, it is better to rectify it. Otherwise, uh, you should uh, use a multi-view stereo uh, algorithm. In that I case. see. And another question is that uh, the if these like stereo images captured by two cameras yep. with parallel camera axis, right? But yep. what if your axis are tilted, like making a triangle? Your your camera are, sorry? Uh, what if our cameras, yeah. the two cameras are uh, not parallel, but slightly tilted towards yeah, but each other? Even if they are not um, perfectly parallel, you can parallelize, you can make it uh, rectified uh, by software. Oh, I see. So it's always rectified by uh, software, yes. OK, got it. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Ah, I have another question. Sorry again. Yeah, sure. Um, these algorithms, um, how fast or how effective are they? If I give them 60 frames per second, um, let's say VGA stereo images, can they give me the depth output also at 60 frames per second? Oh, well, it depends on the network. Uh, most of them, such as Raft Stereo or others architecture we ma uh, Matteo mentioned, um, they are not so real time in the sense that um, 60 frames per second is a very high frame rate. You mm -hmm. should use much compact and lightweight architectures. So till now, at that kind of resolution, you are not able processing stereo images at 60 uh, frame, rate, frame, rate, uh, frame rate per second. OK, and all of these are? But, but there are uh, several architectures um, aimed at improving uh, the runtime. So we didn't discuss about these networks. We uh, discussed the main advances in terms of accuracy. But of course, you can find a lot of architectures specifically suited for uh, real-time processing. And you can find it in our uh, awesome uh, repository if you want. And all of this, uh, mainly because of the academic uh, pursuits, right? You want to find what is the best algorithms, but application-wise? But uh, it depends. It depends on the application. If you are interested in a runtime, yes, of course, you should change uh, the choice of your architecture. But uh, maybe some applications requires um, better accuracy than uh, runtime. So it depends. Yeah, and how much of these algorithms depend on whether you're using monochrome camera, just grayscale, versus RGB color? cameras well, well all, all of them process rgb images but of course they are also trained uh using uh, strong data augmentation so they can also be used using uh, grayscale images so you see they are quite robust in 
this kind of, uh, let's say, problem. I see. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, my last question before I go for uh, getting a snack. Um, do you know the power consumption of this uh, solving the correspondence problem or all this machine learning it, in the, for, for also, VGA theory images? Also, in this case, it depends mostly on the architecture that you select for your purpose. So um, some of them uh, need... Um, a lot of um, power. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, other networks instead are uh, more lightweight, and so the consumption is uh, is uh, not so much powerful. So, I see. So, are we talking about a few milliwatts, ten milliwatts, hundred milliwatts, or we don't know the numbers? Well, actually, I don't know. Most of them use GPUs, so and they are power hungry. Uh, so they require 200, 250 watts. So mm -hmm. it, it depends. It depends on the architecture. Okay, got it. But if you're looking for uh, architecture specifically suited for runtime and yeah. um, very low consumption, uh, yes, you should find uh, lightweight architectures that we didn't mention in this uh, in this tutorial, uh -huh. but there are plenty of architectures. In... And do you know how how low the power they can be for VGA? Well, I, 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 um, I don't know the, the details of each specific architecture, of course, so, uh, but I can provide you some references if you want. Um, yeah, uh, that would be great if you can. If if the articles or the references mention about yeah, sure, 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 uh, sure. milliwatt power consumption, I need. Uh, I would like to know the numbers and yeah, yeah. the latency and something like that. Okay. Thanks, thanks. You're, you're welcome. Give me just one second. I'll, okay, so just uh, I'll send you a link. Yeah. This link here, there is a complete taxonomy. Mm -hmm. of um, foundational deep server architectures, but also uh, efficient oriented deep server architectures. And uh, there is a section uh, in, the, in the taxonomy. And um, there you can find uh, several architectures proposed in the last five years. And all of them uh, want to pursue uh, efficiency. Uh, which section uh, you're talking about? The your um, GitHub. Um, yeah, yeah. And the session, the section is end-to-end uh, -end architectures and mm -hmm. subcategory efficient-oriented deep server architectures. I see. I see. And compared to traditional and maybe less accurate um, stereo matching, mm -hmm. uh, how much more efficient is this uh, deep stereo? or how much power consumption? Is it more or less compared to the traditional ones? Well, all of them use um, GPUs. Mm -hmm. So handcrafted algorithms uh, require just CPU. Mm -hmm. uh, but also in this case, <laughs> the, the answer is it depends. But mm -hmm. in general, yes, handcrafted algorithms are um, not so fast as end-to-end -end architectures, but also require less computation, let's say, in terms of less power, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can also use these networks, lightweight architectures on CPUs to reduce uh, the, the, um, the consumption, but uh, it depends. In general, they are faster, they are more accurate, but they need uh, more power. Maybe. Oh, okay, yeah. Slightly more power, yes. All right, got it. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, I'm back. Wait. Uh, just looking at the schedule, just to have an idea about our updated uh, timeline. Probably I should be faster than expected. Mm, no, I think, ju yeah, just take your time. I can, uh, I can be a little shorter on the, on the other part. Maybe I can start sharing the screen. What do you think? Okay, sure. <laughs> can you see the screen? Um, so the people here are left the audience um, some of them are here but uh, we are uh, resuming in five minutes yeah 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 we are just uh, starting yeah yeah yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, i don't see it yet i'm not sure if that's on my side okay now i see it yeah can you see it so now yeah 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 now it works okay can you also see me or? Yes, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Just a second, I closed the door. Matteo and Fabio, I, I wrote you an email to, if there are technical issues that you can email me because I am not able to do it here on the screen because that is shared with the whole audience and things. Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, thanks a lot for the support. Yes, thank you so much. Did you want to have uh, questions from the audience here at one point? Uh, maybe if there are some from the previous part, uh, maybe we can start with them. Otherwise, uh, we have something like a 45 minutes part and we can take the question after that. Okay. Just, you let me know when I turn um, to the audience and ask them and on the microphone. Okay, great. Mm 
Would you like to start? Yes, sure. Okay, so we can start this part, and from now on, we are going to talk about uh, one of the main, the key fundamental problems of deep stereo matching, end to end deep stereo matching, which is the domain shift problem. Um, so, according to the schedule, uh, right now we are going to, um, we try to answer the question whether uh, stereo matching networks are ready to run uh, in the wild. And so, um, first of all, we we give a very brief definition, basic definition of the domain shift, then we will analyze the main uh, causes, the consequences, the effect, and then we will discuss about the main uh, approaches proposed in the last five years to alleviate uh, this important problem. Of course, as in the case of, uh, of uh, architectures for uh, time constraints, of course, we selected few uh, works, we categorize them uh, into a, a taxonomy, and then uh, we discuss about uh, these few works. But of course, if you are interested, you can find uh, the entire, the, uh, the exhaustive list of papers in our awesome uh, repository. So we can start uh, by reading this very simple definition. And uh, the domain shift is the performance degradation of stereo matching models when applied to scenarios different from the training domain. And the main causes of the domain shift problem, um, we can uh, say that are variations in scene characteristics. So in terms of illumination, texture, semantic, let, let's just consider that most of these uh, serial networks are trained on synthetic datasets and then tested on real world environments. So typically they are tested on one of the most popular data set, synthetic data set, which is the scene flow data set, and then tested on real world environments such as driving scenarios. And other differences, of course, uh, beyond the variations in scene characteristics are the differences in terms of uh, stereo images. So uh, stereo images are typically acquired using different camera setups. So different camera setups are characterized by different baselines, focal length, uh, sensors, uh, noise characteristics, and, and so on. And of course, other causes are related to the discrepancies in depth ranges between the training and testing uh, scene. Let's consider uh, the differences in terms of um, outdoor and uh, indoor environments. And so as a consequence of these causes, these models learn uh, shortcut features that are specific to the training domain. And this, of course, in their generalization to uh, across different environments. And these shortcuts are, um, let's say, uh, consistent local statistics between the left and the right images that are specific to the training domain or uh, specific semantic information appearance of the, the, training, uh, the training images. And of course, the impact of this problem is that uh, these networks are incapable of estimating accurate disparities. And of course, leading uh, to artifacts and several errors in uh, downstreaming applications, such as 3D reconstruction, 3D object detection, and, and so on. And this is a, an example, a qualitative example of the domain shift issue. In this case, we consider uh, one of the most popular stereo architecture in the, in the literature, GANet, proposed at CVPR 2019. And this network is, um, but also other networks, uh, are trained typically on a uh, training scene of uh, synthetic datasets, as in this case, we can see images from the SynFlow dataset and then tested on real world environments, such as the Kitty dataset in this case in the, in the picture. And we can, notice if, if, uh, we can notice that if we train this network on the synthetic data and then we apply this network directly on the, the Kitty dataset, we can uh, notice a huge drop in performance for the disparity uh, estimation. As you can see here in the, in the disparity, you can notice that most of the pixels, most of the estimated disparities are totally wrong. You can notice from the, the road, from the cars and uh, the other regions of the, of the environment. So this is a clear example of the domain uh, shift. 
So now we are going to um, find, we are going to uh, discuss uh, how to alleviate this problem, the domain shift problem. And there are two main approaches to tackle this issue. So the first one is to propose zero shot generalization approaches. So we want robustness across entirely novel and seen domains without any prior knowledge. So we uh, don't require, we don't need um, in advance uh, stereo images of the target environment. We don't need uh, sparse ground truth labels of the target environment. And then we also have domain adaptation techniques. And domain adaptation techniques consist in adapting a source trained model to a target domain use it using a very limited target data to bridge, to alleviate this domain shift issue. So we want uh, architectures with these properties. We want architectures very robust to variations in scene characteristics, invariants to camera setup differences, and also the ability to handle diverse depth ranges. So we can start from um, this very first approach here, the zero shot generalization. And the zero shot generalization is, we can say that it is the capability of a certain network to generalize from one domain, as I mentioned before, the synthetic data, to another one, such as real world scenes without fine tuning. And of course, uh, we have several advantages uh, by applying uh, zero shot generalization uh, strategies. Uh, for example, uh, using uh, so it eliminates, uh, removes the need for costly data acquisition and annotation in the target domain. And also, um, we can also um, apply, deploy these networks without any additional training, fine tuning. So we have just one model, then we apply this model everywhere. And uh, we categorized several strategies that tackle uh, this problem. Uh, among them, we have uh, domain agnostic future modeling techniques, non-parametric cost volume strategies, some techniques that integrate additional geometric cues, and also other strategies that instead are more interested in uh, working directly on data. So uh, there are some works that start uh, from real-world monocular RGB images and then synthesized stereo data to improve the capability of these networks to generalize across these different uh, domains. So we can start from this very, uh, from the first uh, subcategory, domain agnostic uh, feature modeling and approaches in this category focus on learning domain invariant representations to tackle the domain shift. So we can start uh, by talking about this uh, future consistency stereo uh, work proposed at CVPR 2022. And here, uh, the author uh, start by observing the behavior of existing 3D stereo architectures. In particular, um, they noticed that um, if we look at the future consistency of these networks, uh, they are not, this consistency is not preserved. Preserved. This means that if you consider uh, one feature vector on uh, the left image and we look at the same, its corresponding point in the right image using the ground truth information, they notice that the features, uh, the consistency of these features are not preserved. If you look at this image here, you can notice that between corresponding feature vectors, the absolute difference is quite high. And this is not uh, true only uh, for the test set, but they notice that this is also true for the training set that is uh, somehow surprisingly. And so they propose um, an approach to solve this problem. Uh, in particular, they use a contrastive learning approach to, uh, to cope with this problem. In particular, they propose two novel losses. Uh, the first one is stereo contrastive feature loss, and the second one is that the stereo selective widening loss. And the stereo contrastive feature loss, the goal is to enforce the future consistency between uh, matching pixels across view. And as I said before, they apply this um, contrastive learning to make um, matching feature vectors similar 
while making uh, feature vectors of non-matching pixels dissimilar. And in particular, for uh, by analyzing 3D server architectures, they analyzed uh, features just before the constructing the cost volume. And from these features, they create a set of positive and negative um, uh, feature vectors. And in particular, positive feature vectors are um, matching feature vectors using ground truth disparity. So they consider a feature vector on the left image and its corresponding feature vector on the right image. And this is a positive example. Instead, negative examples are just um, pairs of feature vectors belonging to non-matching pixels that are randomly selected in the right in the right image. And after they compute this set of positive and negative uh, feature vectors, they uh, remove all the possible uh, regions in the image that are occluded, in which there are not uh, matching pixels, does not exist between the views. And then they apply the information noisy contrastive estimation loss in order to uh, enforce this feature consistency between uh, matching pixels. For what concerns instead the second loss they um, introduced, the stereo selective widening loss. So uh, this loss is designed to preserve the stereo feature consistency across uh, the different domains. So um, before uh, applying this loss, they uh, use the different normalization for the features. So typically in these networks, the batch normalization is applied. Instead, they uh, use in this case, the instance normalization to these future maps. And they state that this reduces the dependence on data specific characteristics, uh, statistics that instead is a characteristic of the batch normalization. And after that, they identify uh, viewpoint sensitive features between the left and the right images by firstly computing uh, the covariance matrices for the left and the right views. Then they compute the variance matrix that captures the viewpoint sensitivity between the left and the right images. And then from this variance matrix, they select uh, highly sensitive channel pairs using a binary mask. And then after that, they minimize the L1 norm of these mask covariance matrices and so effectively uh, suppressing, removing uh, the sensitive feature components. And they uh, demonstrate both uh, quantitative and qualitative that uh, this promotes, this favors the learning of viewpoint invariant uh, representations. And as you can see uh, from this picture here, uh, we can notice the contribution of each uh, single loss proposed by the others. So starting from the baseline uh, architecture, of course, uh, they demonstrate this using several 3D stereo architectures existing in the literature. And we, you can notice that uh, the baseline architecture is not capable of preserving the future consistency between corresponding points by applying, um, in this case, uh, indicated with the letter C. If we apply the future consistency, um, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the contrastive learning uh, loss, you can notice that uh, the feature consistency is notably um, improved for what concern images in the training set. Uh, it is also slightly improved in the unseen test set. By applying the widening loss alone, uh, the problem still persists, both in the training set and the test set. Instead, if they apply the both together, uh, the consistency, the um, contrastive feature loss and the selective widening loss together, we can notice that the feature consistency between uh, feature vectors in uh, the left and the right images is preserved in both uh, the training set and in the test set. And uh, this is a qualitative example of the improvement they get on, um, on a real world data, in this case is uh, the driving stereo data set. They choose in this case, the PSM net architecture, which is uh, another very popular architecture in the, in the literature. And uh, if we train the network on uh, the synthetic data set, such as the SynFlow data set, uh, you can notice 
that there is a huge drop in performance when tested on the four um, scenes in the, of the driving serial uh, data set across uh, diverse weather conditions. Instead, by training the same network on the synthetic data set using the combination of the uh, contrastive loss and the selective widening loss, the network is capable of uh, recovering uh, to improve its robustness across uh, diverse um, environments. So you can notice here the disparity maps are uh, much more accurate on most of the challenging, uh, challenging uh, regions of, this, uh, of these images. Instead, uh, this is um, another work proposed uh, at CBPR 2022. Its name is ITSA. And ITSA is, a, um, let's say, is an information theoretic approach that automatically uh, avoids shortcut learning. So it restricts the shortcut encoding and favors the generalization. This work is based on this technique, the shortcut perturbation, SCP that is a technique that is used to perturb the input images um, to emphasize uh, pixels that are most sensitive in uh, uh, changes in the input and are likely to include uh, shortcuts. And this shortcut perturbation is used to compute an approximation of the Fisher information loss. And um, so the idea in this case, uh, this perturbation is computed using, uh, based on the gradient of the extracted features with respect to the, to the input. More specifically, uh, in this case, oh, sorry, uh, the idea is based on the following steps. Uh, so also in this case, they consider 3D serial architectures and they compute the gradients of the feature uh, of the features extracted by the feature uh, module here. And then they create a perturbed uh, image uh, starting from the original one plus um, this, uh, the gradients of the feature vectors multiplied by this scalar uh, value epsilon. And the idea is then uh, to compute again the gradients of the feature vectors using this perturbed image. And then uh, they want to minimize this difference. So they want to minimize uh, using a Euclidean dis difference, uh, the Euclidean distance between the feature extracted from the original input image and the perturbed image. And so the idea, the intuition behind this uh, SCP is that um, pixels with large values of the gradients are more responsible in altering let's say, the, uh, the features of the, of the network and so are likely to include uh, shortcuts. So they want to minimize this sensitivity of, of the features. And then the, the entire network, also in this case, they use several 3D architectures to prove uh, their approach, is trained using a combination of the standard smooth L1 loss so uh, the absolute diff the smooth L1 between the estimated disparity and the ground truth disparity, and uh, the approximation of the Fisher information loss based on um, this uh, shortcut perturbation uh, technique. Also in this case, uh, they tested uh, the trained architectures on several uh, datasets, real world datasets, starting from a network pre-trained on a synthetic data. Uh, let's, uh, such as the um, SimFlow dataset. Uh, also, in this case, they consider PSMNet, and we can notice from the second row that the network is not able to predict accurate disparities on unseen environments. If we tune the network using sparse labels on the Kitty dataset, we can notice that the network is able to improve its generalization capability on uh, driving stereo and also slightly improve the results on other datasets. Instead, uh, they demonstrate uh, that using this ITSA approach, using the perturbation uh, technique, they are able to recover uh, to improve the robustness across uh, diverse environments uh, notably. As you can see, uh, the difference between the first and the last, uh, the last row. 
Now, uh, from now on, we are going to talk about uh, non-parametric uh, cost volumes techniques and methods in this category construct the cost volumes using conventional matching functions and thus reducing the sensitivity to domain-specific appearance properties. And this is the first work in this direction, uh, MSNets, Matching Space Networks, proposed at uh, 3DB uh, 2020. And uh, uh, here the idea is uh, very simple. The idea is to replace learned feature extraction with conventional matching function. And we can notice the difference here in the picture. So uh, at the top, we have a standard a conventional end-to-end -end 3D convolution network composed of a feature extraction module, the cost volume computation, then the cost aggregation and the disparity regression. In this case, the authors uh, just replace the first part. So the feature, the learned feature extraction module with a uh, these um, conventional matching functions. So they just move from the uh, color space to the matching space. More specifically, in this case, the, the authors uh, uses four different matching functions, uh, normalized cross correlation, zero sum of absolute difference, the census transform, and also the absolute difference of um, the Sobel operator that we know uh, are insensitive to common variations of the input images, and they are really robust across uh, any environment because they are not learned. So they are non-parametric matching functions. And along with these matching functions, the others also um, concatenate their corresponding confidence. In particular, the confidence in this case is obtained by just converting the cost curve at each pixel with a probability density uh, function for the disparity under consideration. And then, once they replaced uh, the conventional uh, feature extraction module with uh, conventional matching functions, the remaining part of the network is kept uh, the same without uh, any uh, modifications. And similarly to the previous works we talked, um, we can notice that using a couple of architectures such as GCNet and PSMNet, uh, and replacing the learned feature extraction model with conventional matching functions, we can notice the huge improvement in performance when tested on real world environments, such as the one depicted here of the Middlebury uh, dataset. Um, another work that is really similar to the previous one has been proposed at uh, NeurIPS 2022. And also in this case, the authors observed that most of the networks are vulnerable to attacks. And they demonstrated uh, this, uh, this problem using this projected gradient descent attack uh, methodology that um, simply generates adversarial perturbation uh, preserving photometric consistency. So the idea is to uh, considering the left and the right images and just altering the color of corresponding points using a very slight, very small perturbation of the colors. And they noticed that this causes significant performance drop on state-of-the-art uh, networks. And also in this case, we can uh, see the differences between the standard end-to-end -end 3D stereo architectures that we discussed so far and the proposed methodology. And you can notice here, um, the idea is, as the matching space networks, the idea is to use a combination of non-parametric cost volume using the sensor uh, census transform uh, operator at different scales to enlarge the context. And then they use also this parametric contextual feature extraction module. Instead, in this case, uh, it is a learned component and it is used to solve uh, problems on textureless regions, occluded regions, thin structures, and so on. So the final, um, the final uh, cost volume, it is just a combination of this information. And then the network process um, the, the cost volume using a standard encoder, decoder, uh, structure, uh, decoder with um, 
3D uh, convolutions before extracting the, the disparity. Another line of work um, is the integration of additional uh, geometric cues. And here the idea is to incorporate complementary geometric information that can guide the network towards more robust and uh, generalizable predictions. Um, this is uh, the, the first work that uh, tackled the generalization problem using uh, this approach is uh, neural disparity and refinement, NDR. Uh, proposed at 3DV 2021 and extended at TPAMI 2024. Uh, this is proposed by our team. And here the idea is very, very simple. And we know that handcrafted serial matching uh, algorithms are very robust to, uh, uh, to work across diverse environments because they are not based on learned components. And so the idea is that, okay, the problem of these uh, algorithms is that they are not very effective at, uh, for instance, um, predicting at uh, computing the disparity at occluded regions on edge pixels, um, some variations between the left and the right images, some difficult regions. And so the idea is that, okay, uh, they are very good at generalizing. We can just solve some problems of occlusions, uh, problems of depth discontinuities, and improve the, the quality of the disparity using a refinement module. So in this case, the network is a simple uh, encoder-decoder architecture with 2D convolutions. So in this case, there is no uh, 3D cost volume uh, or 3D convolutions. And the idea is just to uh, take as input the RGB image, and the noisy depth. The noisy depth in this case can be computed by any encrafted stereo algorithm. And then the idea is to uh, predict as the final output the refined disparity. I will not go into uh, many details of this work, but the main idea is that it can uh, refine disparities, noisy disparities computed by encrafted algorithms. If you, if you look at these images here, we can notice, for example, uh, disparity maps computed by the popular semi-global matching algorithm. You can notice uh, several noise, uh, several errors at occluded regions here at depth discontinuities, uh, some reflective regions on cars and so on. And so the idea is to just refine these disparity maps using the NDR uh, architecture and you can appreciate the better uh, disparity outcomes by the network, uh, better uh, disparity on the road, on uh, cars, uh, poles, and so on. And it is worth noting that this work is, uh, so this architecture has been trained on the synthetic data set only without seeing any uh, real world um, images. Okay, we now discuss uh, the last subsection of the zero-shot generalization approaches. And in this case, we will analyze uh, methodologies that generate diverse stereo training data directly from easily acquired real-world monocular images. And in these works, the authors demonstrate that uh, using real-world RGB images uh, it is better than using just synthetic stereo, uh, stereo data with ground truth available. So we can start uh, from this uh, work, learning stereo from single images proposed at ECCV 2020. And here the idea is to improve the generalization to unseen domain uh, by generating realistic stereo training data from single real world RGB images. And in this work, uh, so the idea is to start from uh, monocular images, single view images, and then generate um, right images, but they are just synthesized. They are not real. So in this case, in this work, uh, the idea is to avoid the use of existing stereo images uh, and also ground truth information but they just start from this uh, large scale RGB datasets 
and uh, another uh, constraint, uh, the monocular depth network. So in this case, um, they use MIDAS, but also tested with other monocular networks. They use MIDAS uh, to extract an initial estimate of the depth. And then the pipeline is based on uh, several steps. So the first one is uh, convert this depth into disparity using arbitrary baseline. Because in this case, the, the estimated depth map is up to a, uh, an unknown scale factor. So we can use any arbitrary uh, baseline to produce the, uh, the disparity map. Then they apply a disparity sharpening operation to solve uh, some of um, prob over smoothing problems at edge boundaries that are um, present in the uh, estimated disparity. And then in order to compute the synthesized right image, they just apply this forward uh, warping operation. But the problem is that uh, the forward warping operation um, produces holes in the synthesized right image. So when they apply uh, this simple background filling step uh, that just consists of uh, considering taking, selecting um, one image, a random image in the training set, and then uh, fill these holes using a column transfer um, uh, procedure in order to have a consistency in the colors. And then once they obtain this, uh, this synthesized right image, and they have the uh, original input image, they just use this information as input of the stereo network and train uh, this network using the disparities obtained by the monocular uh, depth network using uh, arbitrary uh, baseline. And as you can see here from the um, qualitatives, you can notice um, the improvement of uh, the PSM net architecture when uh, trained on large scale data sets of uh, RGB images uh, with respect to training the same network on uh, the SYNFLOW data set, which is a, a, a synthetic data set. And so uh, the idea is that uh, the key point of this work is that it is better to use uh, larger scale RGB images that are more realistic. They are uh, contain very uh, important semantic information when uh, generalizing across diverse environments. And uh, it is better to use this approach rather than use a synthetic data set to obtain, to, um, to obtain a very robust serial machine network. Okay, now we are going to discuss uh, this is the last work in this um, in this category is nerve supervised deep stereo. This work uh, is a work that we proposed the last year at CVPR 2023, and it shares a similar rationale uh, with respect to the compared to the uh, the previous work. In particular, in this case, uh, we don't rely on any uh, monocular depth network, but we rely on neural radiance field techniques to generate a synthetic stereo training data. And this is done by exploiting uh, real world single camera image sequences. And so uh, the basic idea of this work is that we can exploit neural radiance field to generate uh, views uh, at arbitrary points in the 3D space. And so thanks to uh, this uh, capability of the neural radiance field, we can generate perfectly rectified uh, stereo images. And this can be achieved just by using uh, a smartphone, a single camera. So the pipeline is as follows. Uh, we collected several um, uh, scenes using a smartphone. So we collected the images of a given scene from different viewpoints. These are uh, images from the train set. Then uh, we just computed the, uh, the poses and intrinsics using a uh, call map. And then we, uh, once we obtained the poses, we trained a neural radiance field model. Uh, in our case, we used the instant NGP uh, framework to generate, to render, in this case, uh, 
stereo pairs. In particular, we generate stereo triplets, which means that uh, we generate a center image, a left image, and a right one, and all of these images share the same epipolar line. And um, in particular, the central image is rendered uh, aligned with uh, all the training views. And then we generate the left and the right uh, views, thanks to the uh, capability of uh, the neural radiance field. We also estimate two other quantities. We estimate the underlying 3D encoded by the nerve, but also we estimate the confidence, the uncertainty of the underlying uh, model. And we use all this information to train uh, any serial network. In particular, we use the rendered stereo pair generated in the first step as input of the stereo network. And then we use um, a combination of two losses that we are going to discuss uh, shortly uh, to supervise the predicted disparity by the stereo network. And here you can notice the stereo uh, pairs that we can generate starting from a NERF model using uh, any uh, baseline, thanks to uh, the nerve that can synthesize images at any position in, in space. And for this, for the, the, the complete training, we collect a total of 270 uh, high resolution real world scenes in both indoor and outdoor environments. As I said before, using just one camera, so no serial camera in this case is needed. And for each scene, then we focus on specific objects and acquire 100 images from different uh, viewpoints, ensuring that the scenery is completely static. Uh, and the acquisition protocol in this case involves a set, a set of either front-facing or 360 uh, views. Of course, this data set is also available online if you are interested. And these are, uh, you can appreciate the differences between uh, this uh, by applying the NERF supervised model, so applying NERF on the acquired scenes compared to applying uh, a monocular depth network. So this is a comparison between NERF supervised stereo versus learning stereo from single images. As you can see here, uh, the MIDAS architecture is not capable of uh, estimating very detailed very accurate um, depth, uh, a, a fine structure, fi fine grained um, details, and, and so on. Instead, the NEF uh, serial, uh, the NEF in general is capable of uh, estimating very accurate and detailed disparities also on thin structures. And then the network is trained using a combination of two losses a triplet photometric loss that just measures the photometric difference between the reference image and the warped image using both the left and the right images of the triplet according to the estimated disparity. And we use a triplet photometric loss using uh, three uh, perfectly rectified images because it allows for um, alleviating the problem at occluded regions that is typically characterizing um, the photometric loss between uh, just two uh, stereo, just in a, a stereo pair between the left and right images. And then we apply uh, this uh, rendered disparity loss, which is just a loss between the prediction of the stereo network and the rendered disparity by uh, NERF. In this case, we notice that instant NGP uh, produces very good disparities um, on most challenging regions, but there are also artifacts. So we exploit the ambient occlusion, the uncertainty of the model to filter out disparities and so obtain uh, more reliable um, depth points that can be used to supervise the stereo uh, architecture. Here we can uh, show um, some qualitatives on the Middlebury dataset. We consider two images of the Middlebury 2014 uh, dataset. Uh, we can notice the difference between uh, the standard photometric loss that is typically used for self-supervised training and our uh, NERF-supervised 
model. You can notice better depth predictions on thin structures and fine details. Instead, if we use the trinocular photometric loss alone, we can notice that uh, the network is able to recover uh, good estimates at occluded regions. This is instead the comparison with respect to the um, learning stereo from single images, the ICCV works that we mentioned uh, so far. And also in this case, you can notice that using our NAF supervised approach can greatly improve the disparities on uh, thin structures. And this is that the final uh, qualitative example of um, the differences between uh, the methodologies, some of the methodologies we discussed so far. Uh, so for instance, ITSA, uh, learning stereo from single images and the NAF supervised approach. And you can notice that all of them produces very good outcomes, very good disparities, but in general using uh, real world data from uh, single view RGB images of large scale uh, data sets, we can achieve better results, especially using the NERF, uh, the NERF approach. And this, is, this can be highlighted here uh, on uh, thin structures, for instance. I think uh, I'm done with this part. Um, and then uh, I'll give you the, the okay. word. Okay. Thank you very if, much. I don't know if anyone has questions. Uh, maybe we can keep the questions for the very end of this uh, part. Oh, sure. I'll try to be short so we can have a recap on both approaches to deal with domain shift. So in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I will talk about uh, an orthogonal strategy to deal with uh, domain shift, which is domain adaptation. And uh, from the introduction, uh, we already mentioned that this uh, technique uh, is a little more longstanding. It existed before uh, the researchers started to pursue generalization and robustness. And uh, Let's say domain adaptation can be defined as the specific process of trying to improve the accuracy by our stereo network on a specific domain that have not been seen during training. So for instance, we might have a stereo network trained on synthetic images and we want to adapt it to real images. And uh, this strategy has some advantages with respect to uh, generalization because it allows for overcoming a domain shift that we cannot predict at training time. So at training time, we are no longer asked to properly generalize to any unseen possible domain because we can still exploit adaptation in the case we are not capable of generalizing. And usually these approaches are uh, not supervised, are uh, unsupervised approaches. So we just need to collect some images for the target domain. And it is very flexible because we can either perform uh, this uh, process in online manner or in offline manner, of course, uh, with different strengths and weaknesses. And uh, accordingly, we are going to see two main families of approaches that are respectively offline adaptation, which are inexpensive at deployment time because uh, at deployment time we, were, we will uh, run a network that has been previously adapted, but this approach requires to have access to the domain data in advance in order to carry out the adaptation, of course, in offline manner. While on the other hand, we have online adaptation, which does not require any data, any data to be available in advance, However, this makes uh, the complexity increase at deployment time because uh, the adaptation process itself is uh, carried out uh, as soon as we get the images that we are processing uh, in the real applications. So I will start with uh, a few examples of offline adaptation. One is Ada Stereo, published as CBPR 2021. And uh, Ada Stereo is uh, taught for uh, adapting in offline manner, a stereo network that uh, can be trained on synthetic images provided with ground truth annotations and to adapt it to real images for which we don't have any ground truth annotation. And uh, Ada Stereo builds over three main components. 
The first one is a color transfer module because that basically uh, transfers uh, the color properties from uh, the source domain, which is the one for which we have uh, ground truth labels, uh, to those of the target domain and vice versa. In particular, what uh, they do with this color transfer is uh, to make the source domain images look like uh, more similar to the real images that we are going to process at test time. This way, we are going to obtain some strong supervision for the depth from the ground truth labels, still on images that have some properties common to those of the target domain. Then the second one is uh, a cost volume normalization uh, module that is in charge of normalizing the image features both uh, uh, locally uh, over pixels as well as uh, over the channels in order to reduce the uh, distribution shift between the features extracted over the different domains. And finally, uh, to obtain supervision on the unlabeled target images, uh, the authors propose a self-supervised occlusion-aware reconstruction loss that is very similar to the reprojection loss that Fabio mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, but takes into account the occlusions uh, that are caused uh, by the different viewpoints between the left and the right image. And these uh, uh, occlusions masks that are predicted by a specific module are used to uh, avoid supervising the network with the reprojection loss on these uh, ill-posed regions. And here we can see some examples of what happens uh, by transferring the colors from the target to the source domain. So here we have a synthetic image from the scene flow dataset. Here we have a real image from the mid dataset. data set. And this is how the scene flow image looks after we have transferred the color from Midelbury to the synthetic data set. And here at the bottom, we can see the effectiveness of this approach. We can see some images from Kitty and Midelbury and some qualitative results obtained by the pre-trained PSM net uh, uh, checkpoints available from uh, the original paper, as well as those trained by implementing the ADA stereo framework uh, jointly with uh, the PSM net uh, architecture. And we can notice how the results uh, are much uh, cleaner. Uh, several artifacts are no longer present, uh, either on Midelbury as well as on the Kitty dataset. And another approach is the reusable architecture growth uh, uh, framework uh, published at CVPR last year. And this framework, uh, in short, uh, dubbed uh, RAG, exploits uh, once again neural architecture search in a way similar to Lia Stereo that we have presented uh, an hour ago, more or less. And uh, basically, it uses neural architecture search to take a pre-trained stereo network and make it grow when adapting to specific domains. Specifically, the authors selected the four different domains for, from the driving stereo datasets being characterized by rain, fog, cloud, and uh, sunny environments. And uh, for each of these domains, uh, uh, the pre-trained network is uh, further optimized to be, um, to be basically enhanced with additional components, additional modules, additional convolutional layers in order to obtain a, a, a new uh, domain-specific stereo network that has been specialized on the single specific domain. And the assumption behind this is that a priori we can have uh, knowledge about the domains that we will face. And once we are at uh, deployment time, we simply need to identify which domain we are going to face right now, and then select the specific architecture that we have searched during the offline adaptation stage. And for this purpose, uh, the authors propose a scene router network that basically is composed of a set of autoencoders, each one trained over a single specific domain to take one input image as the input of the network and to basically reproduce the very same image as the output. At test time, given the N architectures that we have uh, discovered for the specific domains and the scene router network, at any time we, we have a new stereo pair, we take the left image, we process it with the autoencoders and we look for the autoencoder giving us the lowest reconstruction error. That will be the specific uh, autoencoder 
uh, selecting the domains that we are going to face right now. And given this domain, we are going to select the very specific architecture that we have obtained during the adaptation process. And this is how the framework looks like. So we start from an initial model and we run a neural architecture search. But you know, uh, probably if you are familiar with uh, this kind of approaches, neural architecture search is very complex and time consuming. And the authors so designed some uh, efficient strategy to minimize the amount of configuration to be searched during the adaptation process. In uh, particular, they during uh, the search process, they maintain a record of the existing cells that have been already tried, and they increase the probability of sampling these cells again, in particular those that were already available from the pre-trained model. And the second one is to slightly modify the validation score using during the neural architecture search process. Indeed, this score is used is used to measure the quality of the network that uh, has been uh, searched for. And uh, this score has, be, has been modified by the authors to take into account the amount of reused parameters. Specifically, the more parameters uh, the new model is using, the better the validation score will be. And here we can see some qualitative results on the driving stereo data set in comparison with uh, MADNET, which was uh, one of the very first online adaptation method proposed by my team at CPR19. And we can see how the uh, specific uh, RAG framework that has been trained on the single specific domains is capable of much higher accuracy with respect to MADNET being adapted somewhere else and transferred on the driving stereo dataset. Now I'll move uh, uh, very quickly on online adaptation just to provide you an example about uh, uh, this second family of approaches. And in particular, I, I will introduce uh, uh, our latest work on the topic that uh, should have been of course presented as a poster at CVPR. But uh, of course, uh, since we are not there, unfortunately, feel free to drop us an email for ask any question or feel free to watch our video on YouTube. So uh, assuming uh, that we can generalize uh, with uh, some good training practice, uh, we still can face some domains that are much more challenging compared to others. And as we can see in this example, here we are facing some nighttime images, which are very, very different from anything we have seen so far. And uh, if we deploy a compact architecture that is uh, designed for running in real time, even if this network has been trained with the best practices for achieving generalization, the performance would be not that good. So what we can do, we can run online domain adaptation according to our previous work in uh, published in CVPR 19 that I will recall in a while. This way we can adapt to any single stereo pair we process uh, as soon as we get them. But of course, uh, uh, running, uh, running the adaptation process requires to compute uh, some self-supervised losses and of course uh, to run back propagation, which uh, is uh, computationally expensive and makes the frame rate drop, even if we are still improving the accuracy. So with uh, our CVPR 2024 paper, we were wondering what happens if I need to adapt, but uh, my hardware cannot support the adaptation. So I cannot uh, increase the complexity of the model I'm running. Can I still, uh, to some extent, adapt to the domain I'm, I'm facing? And uh, actually the answer we found is yes, if we assume that the domain adaptation itself is not uh, a single model uh, process, but if we assume that at the same time, we might have a fleet of neural networks, of course, sharing the same architecture that can adapt on their single domains and can share the knowledge. So from this idea, we proposed the federated online adaptation for deep stereo, which works like this. So let's assume we have a single neural network running on an unseen domain. And this neural network is capable of adapting. So adapting in online manner means that for any stereo pair BT we receive during the during the processing, we can compute a self-supervised loss and we can backpropagate over the full uh, the full architecture to update the weights of the single model in a way that for the next stereo pairs I, I will receive in the future my my network is a little more accurate on this single domain. 
And for run this kind of adaptation, it's in CVPR, we proposed uh, an approach uh, exploiting uh, self-supervised losses. So using the reprojection error as Fabio introduced before. And lately in uh, a TPAMI extension of this work, we also showed that we can also use uh, the guidance from a stereo algorithm like semi-global matching to overcome the domain shift. So that being said, of course, adapting the whole model is uh, time consuming. So at CDPR, we propose a heuristic to simply select a subset of the total amount of weights in our neural network and to compute a loss function that allows for uh, running back propagation only on that portion of the neural network itself. This strategy was uh, dubbed as uh, MAD, modular adaptation. And of course, uh, lately in TPAMI, we proposed a variant uh, exploiting uh, the labels from semi-global matching in place of the reprojection error. So everything I, I've introduced so far is uh, what we can do for running online adaptation on a single domain. And this will make the network improve over time. So after T, 2T, 3T, 4T, the network will be better and better on the single domain. Now let's uh, go beyond and introduce uh, how we can uh, carry out adaptation in federated manner. So first, uh, let's assume we have a central, a central server that is dispatched somewhere in the cloud. And let's assume that this server is uh, always waiting for some updates from uh, any of the deep stereo networks dispatched over the world that are adapting on the specific domain they are facing. So we will have uh, basically a server running a, a eternal while true uh, cycle, and that will ask for the clients that he is aware of running in the world for some updates. What do we mean for updates? For updates, we mean the uh, updated weights that the model is is uh, uh, learning over time. So let's assume uh, we define some uh, regular interval at which uh, we feel our model has improved enough. And at, at, this, at these regular intervals, the adapting client sends the updated weights to the central server. This means any of the weights of the model are shared with the server. Then we can extend this, of course, to a fleet of neural networks. So let's assume we have a second network running on a very different domains and at regular time intervals, which will be, of course, different from those of the blue network. The yellow network will send its own updates to the server. Of course, to make this uh, uh, in a realistic setting, the two blue and yellow neural networks runs in a synchronous manner. So the two timestamps of the blue and the yellow networks are completely independent. We just know at some point the server will receive the updates from both or from more of them, of course, let's say up to n clients. This means once the server receives these n updates, it, it can merge them. In particular, it can exploit one of the fundamentals of federated learning, which consists of averaging the weights received by the single clients. And once these weights have been averaged, they can be sent to any possible client that is running on different domains and yet is not adapting to the domain itself. So we have this green network that we assume is not capable of conducting adaptation of its own for several reasons, maybe because the hardware is, uh, uh, is not powerful enough or any other condition we can imagine. So at regular intervals that are dictated by the server, the client, this uh, passive client will receive some updated weights and its accuracy will improve over time, even if the client itself is not adapting actively to its own domain. Of course, sharing these weights over the cloud introduces some overhead. So we have the green client not having any computational overhead, but we are introducing a network communication overhead because we are transmitting data between the clients to the server and from the server to the uh, passive client. So we also introduced in this paper a heuristic that similarly to our previous single domain adaptation paper, selects only a portion of the wakes from each of the client, sends all, only this portion to the central server. Then the server will, uh, of course, aggregate only the portions that he has been received, and it will send only these portions to the final client. 
we will see in a while how this can reduce the uh, the network uh, the network transfer overhead of course slightly reducing the effectiveness of the accuracy of the overall adaptation process so i'm showing you some qualitative results i'll start from the kitty data set where you, we you, um, maybe you want to uh, wrap up because uh, we will uh, need to finish uh, okay sure and then um, um, yeah, leave some okay. questions for the audience. Okay, yeah, I conclude this uh, slide by just showing some qualitative results. So we have uh, some real-time architectures that uh, while not running any adaptation, they perform poorly, while if they run a single domain adaptation can improve by looking at the full plus plus uh, labels. And finally, by running the federated adaptation, they can improve uh, even further. Here, I'm just showing some plots uh, where we played a little with the hyperparameters in our framework. So we played with the update frequencies by the clients and the amount of clients. And uh, we plotted on the top the accuracy that we obtained through the federated adaptation, while on the bottom we show the, uh, the, the data that is moving over the network. So the blue curves refers to the naive approach in which all of the weights are moved across the networks, while the green shows our heuristic that, of course, is slightly less accurate in terms of accuracy, but dramatically reduce the amount of data that we need to transfer across the network. Finally, some additional qualitative results on a slightly more challenging data set that we can basically confirm the accuracy of the, our technique. So that's all for this part. And uh, feel Thank free you. to I ask. I think there is a question for you. It's, uh, OK. A... Hi. Uh, so this is more of a general question and probably more adapted to the first part of the talk. Uh, do you have any comments on speed? Because since more of the, most of these methods are going to be usually like uh, used in SLAM, for example, so uh, how do you, uh, what's, uh, what's, your, what's your comment on speed and how fast these methods are to predict the, the stereo magic? Thank you. Okay, yeah, maybe I can take this one. Yeah, most, uh, most of the state-of-the-art architectures can run uh, not really in real time because uh, in particular those that we uh, mentioned in the first part, uh, they are usually running at uh, maximum let's say between five to 10 frames per seconds on, uh, of course, uh, on a high-end GPU. Of course, uh, there exist also some real-time architectures and those that we used in this uh, latest work I presented uh, were uh, devoted to real-time processing. Of course, uh, they trade uh, their accuracy a little to be, be, to be capable of running in real-time. But I think they are a very good compromise uh, if you need uh, real-time processing and still get uh, some uh, accurate results for your application. Um, if, if you had to pick a single network that is fast and accurate, which one would be? Okay, great question. Probably from the first part, I would go for Unimatch. Because when we played with it, uh, it was quite fast. It was, uh, I think... Uh, at least 10 frames per second. And its accuracy was great. It was uh, almost on par with the very latest. So probably I think this could be for now the best trade-off between the two. Thank you. Um, hi, I have a question related to, again, the first half of the talk. Uh, in the initial slides, you mentioned about talking uh, uh, about different modalities, uh, not just the color images. Uh, do you have any suggestions uh, of the network that can be used for different modalities, such as infrared or uh, for scenarios where we, uh, for the for the reflective surfaces, uh, what are the best approaches in your opinion? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, several of the networks used for these different modalities are inspired by those that we have seen in the first part. So unfortunately, we don't have the time for covering this in this tutorial, but if we look at our Ewison Stereo repository, you can find all of the resources and you will see there that any of the approaches are inspired by the, let's say, RGB, RGB literature. Okay, thank you. And there is one more question. 
Hello. Um, I have a question on the the def distance range. Um, so if I were to um get the depth for I don't know like the farther distance, what kind of architecture is the best for this? Given that you know the source camera has good enough resolution. I think there's. Probably there's not a real winner in this. Mm, let's say in the past, uh, we figured out uh, a couple of architectures were not that good uh, at generalizing to small disparities because basically far in the distance means your disparity is very tiny. And uh, this is probably, this probably depends with the resolution at which you compute the cost volume. But I would say recently, all of the architectures inspired by Raft, Raft Stereo are quite robust to this. Of course, the, the basic hypothesis is that in your training data, you have a good distribution of disparities that is also meaningful for these very long range scenes. OK, um, one additional question to the uni match. So it does the depth, the disparity, and the flow, right? Um, is there any way that we can combine segmentation along with the, um, I guess, depth or disparity maps? Yes, uh, there were a couple of works uh, in 2019 and 2020 that uh, were predicting both disparity and segmentation uh, masks. Again, you can find them uh, in our uh, deep stereo repository. And uh, yeah, this is not a very common approach. So there, are be there have been... Uh, very few works on this, but uh, yeah, this is possible, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, more questions from the audience? Please, please come forward. There is one. Um, so, as I understand, um, you talked a lot about um, searching for new models, new architectures. Um, I want to hear, I guess, some of your perspectives on the uh, data side. Like, what do you think is the future for, right? I know you touched on it a bit with the, um, the NERF supervised data, but like, what do you think is the future of, you know, better data sets for stereo matching? Um, any thoughts specifically on uh, I guess, better synthetic data for stereo matching? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think we should move on both direction because yeah, as soon as the yeah synthetic engines gets better, for instance, now we have Unreal 5, which is uh, great. We can have uh, synthetic images that looks more like real images. And the good point is that uh, for these images, you have perfect ground truth. And perfect ground truth is something you cannot have uh, with, with any kind of depth sensor you use uh, for collecting real images. So let's say having synthetic images that looks uh, as good as the real images probably will be one of the best uh, solutions. Of course, uh, in parallel to if we are capable of collecting real images with uh, better annotations, combining the two approaches will probably be the winning strategy, yeah. And uh, probably what we are really missing uh, is uh, a very, very large data set uh, made of a uh, million of images. I don't think there's nothing uh, getting close to this for stereo. And with this kind of data, probably we will uh, greatly improve all of the results we have seen today. Thank you. More questions? There is one coming. Hi, I wonder if you have any input on stereo images that have not been captured at exactly the same moment. For example, in aerial imagery, we usually have we take a picture every few seconds, and in this time, cars or vegetation might be moving, and then you have an issue of matching. Do you have any any info, any helpful suggestions on how to deal with that? Well, let's say here we have two two possible problems. Let's say the movement uh, that might occur uh, with your camera between uh, the two timestamps, and of course the movement of the content in the scene. So 
if the 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 if the only thing moving is your camera, maybe you can deal with it because uh, you can simply assume these uh, as a depth estimation, depth from motion estimation. While if you have something moving uh, in between uh, the two acquisitions, so for instance, you have a car that is moving forward, uh, mm, I think this is a much more challenging problem. And uh, yeah, if uh, the if the motion displacement occurs between the two images, this is very challenging. On the contrary, maybe if you have multiple synchronized images, of course, this is another task and this is much, much simpler. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, it seems like there are no more questions. So, or there is, okay. Okay, there is. <laughs> uh, I guess quick question on your your input regarding multitask uh, uh, training, and if uh, if a stereo model is a good cut good candidate to be part of a multitask training framework, let's say train image object detection segmentation and stereo together. Yeah, there have been a couple of works, uh, very, very few, uh, combining uh, stereo matching and object detection, for instance. And they were basically trying to prove uh, that uh, the depth you get from a stereo network uh, is better for 3D object detection. I think uh, the paper is something like pseudo LiDAR plus plus, something like this. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, I think this is fully compatible with uh, multitask learning frameworks, uh, either combined uh, stereo and optical flow, stereo and semantics. Uh, yeah, you just need to think a little about uh, how to um, design your architecture to deal with the different tasks. But uh, yeah, this is perfectly feasible. Yeah. Thank you. One more, one more question. Hi, one more question. So um, in terms of monocular versus the stereo, um, I see there is a lot of monocular depth estimation, um, the research that has been done since like 2020, I think, but hasn't seen that much of a stereo. Do you have any takes on why it is kind of moving into the monocular financials? Well, I would say because uh monocular is what you would ideally want to to have because uh, for estimating if you if you could estimate depth out of a single image that would be much much simpler you would not need uh, a stereo camera which of course uh, the stereo camera needs to be uh, calibrated then when you go in the wild maybe you have vibrations and your calibrations get off so in principle, I would say if we could have the perfect uh, monocular depth estimation model, I would go for that, of course, because it's much cheaper and much simpler to use. The point is that, uh, of course, uh, monocular depth estimation is much more challenging. Despite we had uh, great uh, advances, uh, you might still find a uh, very strange picture that uh, fools your model and uh, in particular tomorrow we have uh, at the monocular depth estimation challenge we will have a talk about this uh, there are still some cases in which these mono depth frameworks uh, fail uh, while of course a stereo is a little more reliable but you know for stereo you need two cameras two cameras are more expensive uh, cumbersome and so on so i think that's why people would prefer uh, uh, getting depth from a single image Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, your tutorial and um, uh, maybe an applause. <laughs> thank you very much for your support because of course this tutorial would have, would haven't been possible without your uh, help. So we are very grateful Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Have a great day. And I email you some pictures. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.